Jordan Peterson on The Delve. Whatever that means. Mr. Reagan. So this is an Irish uh, show of some kind. It was all right. The guy wasn't particularly combative. This is going to be a short one. There isn't a whole lot here that Jordan Peterson hasn't covered in other interviews, so I didn't find it particularly interesting. The whole first half of the interview is just a recap of Jordan Peterson's rise to fame. I don't know if he's that famous in Ireland. I, I expect that he probably is. I'm not really sure why they covered that so much, but anyway. There's a Chris Rock quote here, would you believe? I think it's from 2004, the 2004 election. But the whole country's got a up mentality, man. We all got a gang mentality. Republicans are idiots, and Democrats are idiots, and conservatives are idiots, and liberals are idiots, and anyone that makes up their mind before they hit an issue is a fool, okay? Everybody. No, no, hold up. Everybody's so busy wanting to be down with a gang. I'm a conservative, I'm liberal, I'm conservative. It's bullshit. Be a person. Listen. Let it swirl around your head, then form your opinion. Is that something that you would agree with? Because at the time I was, I mean, relatively young, and I remember kind of... Well, we're all fools, yeah. which is why we have to talk, right? Because that's one of the ways you can talk yourself out of being a fool. Otherwise, why talk? I mean, obviously, there's utility in, in speaking to other people, and part of the utility is to augment your viewpoint on the off chance that there's something that you don't know. And since there's many things you don't know, well, it's, it's, it pays to listen. I think the majority of people, the majority of the time, are actually quite reasonable and would rather learn something. That's what it looks like to me. I actually talk about this quite a lot. I think people on the right should listen to, watch, or read leftist media at least a little bit, just so that we have an idea of what they're talking about on that side. And the same goes for the left. They should all watch Peterson, they should all watch Shapiro, they should all watch Fox News. I personally, I listen to BBC News, I watch Sky News, uh, which is a British, British news. I watch France 24, I watch Deutsche Welle, which is a kind of a German news, which a good friend of mine is on, and I won't name her because she's a staunch leftist, and she would kill me. <laughs> and I read a variety of leftist online publications. You know, whenever a topic comes up, I'll, I want the left perspective. And I think this is valuable. Art of war, know your enemy. One of the things that characterizes people who are temperamentally inclined to be on the left is that they don't draw borders. You don't, because you want information to flow freely. And so, if you don't like borders, this is partly why Trump knew that making borders, borders the issue was an intelligent political move. He intuited that borders are actually the primary, what would you call, domain of dispute across the political axis. But it's borders at every level, border between concepts, borders between people, borders between cities and states and, and, and countries. It's the pr prime political issue. The leftists are skeptical of borders because they interfere, interfere with the flow of information. So you, think there, you think there's a psychological reason why? Oh, definitely, there's yeah. no doubt about it. People do vote their temperaments. But one of the problems with that is because the leftists can't draw borders, they can't draw borders around those who are too radical. Yeah. It's less troublesome on the right because right-wingers are willing to draw borders. Now, I think it's also easier technically because there's something you can point to. Oh, there's a claim of ethnic or racial superiority. Box. Shelved. It's very hard to do on the left, but it's necessary. This is interesting. He's drawing a parallel between the left's inability to draw borders psychologically with the left's inability to draw a distinction between the moderate left and the radical left. Well, I also think that there's another problem, and that's that the radical left and the moderate left have the same goals. The moderate right and the radical right do not have the same goals. The moderate right does not want to send all African Americans back to Africa and have a white ethno state. Okay, The radical right seems to. Normal right-wing people don't want to see an ethnostate. They just want the world to get better. And to follow up on what Jordan Peterson was saying about the border thing, they don't like to make borders in their minds. I also think that's partly due to the idea that the typical leftist has a sort of an emotional problem dissecting the left because it makes them feel bad, right? Well, we don't want there to be disenfranchised people, so we don't want to say, you know, you're not part of our group, right? They don't like the idea of excluding people from their group. Um, on the moderate left. Now, the radical left does not care at all about that. <laughs> They're constantly excluding people from their group. In fact, I would say most people on the radical left don't even consider moderate leftists to be leftists, which is crazy, but whatever. Okay, let, let's talk about Trump then briefly for a sec. The worst thing, from my point of view, that he does is make it seem okay 
to be a troll and to be a troll in real life mm -hmm. and, to, and to use the kind of language that he uses. And now, I think that might be the worst thing that he does. It's possible that that's the worst thing that he does. Um, Trump, the Trump phenomena, phenomenon probably worries me less than people think it should. But there are reasons for that. The first reason is that I don't really think that the American people are more polarized now than they were 10 years ago. And the reason I think that is because for 20 years, 50% of them have voted for Republicans, 50% of them have voted for Democrats. It hasn't moved. It's been exactly the same. Now this time they had Clinton and Trump as candidates and perhaps that was unfortunate. You know, and I also don't think Trump won the election. I think Clinton lost the election. It was her, she had it in the bag. There were a number of things she did that were really not very bright, like play identity politics that cost her the election. I don't think that the Americans are any more polarized than they were under, under Nixon. And so they've muddled through this sort of thing before. Trump is an anomaly, in my estimation. Um, he isn't a typical Republican. He's quite bombastic and assertive. He's not a typical conservative. In fact, he wasn't a conservative, I don't think, he's at all before. He's a registered Democrat, well, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, and he's got an entrepreneurial bent as yeah. well. And entrepreneurial types tend to be liberal well, that's what rather he sold than himself conservative. On, I well, as president. well, he is an entrepreneur. Yeah. He's an author. He, he had a successful TV show. He's had his real estate dealings. And you can quibble about how successful he was at some of those things. He was certainly successful on TV. And so he's got the, an entrepreneurial temperament. So he's a strange person. He's an idiosyncratic person. And the one thing I would say in his favor, as far as I'm concerned so far, is that he has not embroiled the U.S. in an additional stupid war. And that's happened a lot in the last 15 years. And the fact that that hasn't happened so far, I'm quite happy about. So he's noisy. He's provocative, that's for sure. He seems impulsive, um, although it's hard to tell how much of that is crafted, you know. Um, he's definitely disagreeable, which is quite interesting, and that, that comes out in his Twitter behavior and so forth, and in the way that he handles his political allies, for that matter. He's certainly not currying favor, and you can make the case that he's a divisive figure. People are more upset in the United States than I've seen. Certainly, I lived there for six years in the 90s. People are more upset now than they were then. The, the, the tension is palpable, um, but I'm not convinced that that reflects a genuine polarization on the part of the populace itself. So I'm not too worried about the situation in the United States. I think the Americans have been through far worse than what they're going through now. The economy's in reasonable shape, although people argue about how sustainable that is. I think what's happening in North Korea is extremely interesting. I mean, I'm not optimistic about it because anybody with any sense would never be optimistic about North Korea, but um, it could be worse. I mean, how do you judge the success of an American president? Not engaging in a stupid war is a nice start. It's interesting what he's saying here. My, my buddy Kurt actually, um, actually said something to me about Trump that I thought was kind of fascinating. It wasn't something I had considered before. I told him that I was hesitant to vote for Trump when he first started to run for president because I didn't think he was a true conservative. But he's proved himself since to be a true conservative. But then Kurt said to me, you know what, I don't know if he was a true conservative before. I think it's possible that, that Trump was, to some degree, a leftist before he, before he ran for president. But because he had such loyalty and love from the right when he was running, he rewarded that loyalty and love with becoming more right-wing. So Kurt's theory is that Trump wasn't as right-wing before he was elected. It was through the campaign that he sort of started to adopt all the right-wing ideas, and now he's solidly right-wing, which I find really fascinating. I, and I think is actually prob probably true. I don't know for sure. I'd have to actually talk to Donald Trump to figure that out. But it, it's a really interesting observation. I think, I think he might be right. Um, Michal wants to know, he says, he's interested in your thoughts uh, as a psychologist on the Irish psyche. Um, I know you haven't been here for very long, but, you know, has there been any experience with uh, Ireland and its, its psychologists or psychology? Not, not the psychologists per se. I mean, your, your culture seems to be quite remarkably literary. I don't, I, did, I don't think I'm in a position to say anything particularly intelligent about the Irish psyche beyond that. I think the fact that, that you have this immensely powerful literary tradition is really something. And 
something worth celebrating and something quite remarkable. So more power to you as far as I'm concerned. The Irish psyche. <laughs> Peterson gives a very limited answer here, but I'm going to give a more expansive one. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny because Peterson's Canadian. I'm from Oregon. I found in my experience, Oregonians, Canadians, and Australians are very similar. And we're similar because we're very practical. Um, we pride ourselves, actually, on our pragmatism. And I tend to find Irish people are exactly the same. They're very down to earth. In fact, they, in fact, they kind of ridicule any kind of hubris. They revere humility. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I relate to that. Being from Oregon, I totally relate to that. I really admire the Irish sense of tradition, their adherence to Catholic values. But then there's another side to, to the Irish psyche, which is in kind of opposition to that traditionalism. And I think it comes from, you know, there's a lot to be proud of being Irish and, you know, their Irish history and their, and the sort of beauty of the country. But then that comes into conflict with the sort of like over sexualization of western media so you get this you get this culture clash right traditional irishness with modernity and i think that's a real shame a lot of countries have gone through this um and i think that they've come out worse for it you know i see a lot of countries rejecting christianity in europe uh you know the scandinavian countries obviously and it's and it's so disheartening to see that i mean if you're the kind of irish person that's attracted to modernity you kind of resent the old-fashionedness of the place, and I really, really hate that. I, I wish more Irish people, especially young Irish people, would embrace their Irishness and, and recognize the value of their traditions and just the oldness of Ireland, right? There is a lot of value there. I mean, Americans, Americans love that stuff. We romanticize that stuff because we don't have it. We don't have castles, okay? We don't have these ancient traditions. We don't have that ancient history. You know, we do have traditions, we do have history, but we don't have that ancient history. That's that's very captivating for us. We love it. And you as Irish people, you should love it too. Is there any movie in the past 10 years or so uh, that thought maybe I could use that in a certain way in my lectures to, to put across a point? Oh, I, I've thought about doing that with some of the superhero movies, the, the Marvel movies in particular. I could do that with Batman and and the Joker, especially the Heath Ledger performance, that's probably more than 10 years old because Heath Ledger did a great job of Incredible. playing the Joker. Yeah, yeah, maybe it killed him, Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, what I really liked about the Joker's character was that he wasn't trying to win. He was trying to lose, right? It's very, very difficult to deal with someone who's trying to lose. He just wanted chaos. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. And he, and he definitely did represent... That's why it's a part of, yeah. mm -hmm, And there is a part of people's psyche, especially when they become extraordinarily resentful and bitter is they're not aiming up the people who shoot up high schools and then kill themselves they're aiming down they're very successful at attaining it as well so it's 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 that's an interesting part of the psyche to try to to try to shed some light on although it's dangerous this is fascinating people who are trying to lose like physicists talk about entropy which is na nature's tendency toward disorder right? So if you build a wall, it's a sort of simple construction, but it's very precisely organized, right? You have to organize stone by stone. Over time, the elements will destroy that. It'll, it'll pick apart that, that stone wall until it's nothing, right? Until it's dust. Total disorder. From order, disorder. That's how the universe is set up. It's an interesting point. Uh, you know, so he, what he's saying is somebody who is aiming toward disorder with absolutely no constructive goal is a very difficult person to stop, right? But I do think that there is a solution to this. It's one of those solutions that's very simple but very difficult to implement. The more ethical the society is that we create, the fewer psychopaths should emerge. And I absolutely believe that. I think that's 100% true. How should you conceptualize your life? Peace and tranquility? I don't think so. I think if you're lucky, your life is an adventure. And that's fine. I think that's the best you get, is that you're contending. You're contending with life successfully. And so that's the situation that I'm in, and that's fine. If you're lucky, your life is an adventure. I love that. I couldn't have said it better myself. When you're a kid, people ask you what you want to do when you grow up. And I used to say, I want to go on adventures. That was my... <laughs> and that had a lot to do with the fiction that I read and watched and stuff. But I think at the end of the day, that's sort of everybody's 
desire, great desire. I mean, I think this is why people go on vacations to some extent. People say it's to relax, but how often do you go on a vacation and come back relaxed? You always go on a vacation and end up totally stressed out and exhausted. We're often going on a vacation to challenge ourselves, right? To give ourselves new, interesting experiences. Honestly, like if we went on a vacation to feel good, we would go to a really expensive hotel and we would spend the whole time in the hotel. He said, he, he's involved in many projects, he said the only time he really feels like he's accomplished something is when he's writing. And I kind of feel that way too. Like if, I, if I've written during the day, then I really feel like I've done something that justified the day. And lecturing is like that and clinical work is like that, but writing is definitely like that. Writing makes you feel like you've done something that justifies the day. As a writer, I 100% approve of this message. All right, that's the end of this one. So now I have some Mr. Reagan merchandise available, link in the description. If you like these videos, you just wanna contribute a couple of dollars, you can add to my Patreon, that's also in the description. That would be immensely helpful. And I'm going to publish a book soon. It's not about politics, it's a fiction, but the reason I'm making it available is I do think conservatives need creators of fiction that they know they can trust. They know they don't have to read every detail of every story and try to figure out what is the leftist agenda here. That's always frustrating. You're safe if you read a story from me. There's no leftist agenda. It's all pro-conservative. It's all pro-Christian stuff. And so I want to make that available to everybody. And I'm not requiring anybody to pay for it. But if you can pay for it, there will be a suggested price. And if you're broke, don't worry about it. Just read it, right? You know, I don't want anybody paying for this book that, that can't afford it. And if you really love it, you can give me a million dollars. I will accept it. <laughs> That's it for me. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more like it, please subscribe. And if you hate me, go ahead and say so in the comments. I won't censor it. I promote the free exchange of ideas, no matter how bad they are. Together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you.